Hello, and my name's Lisa Cherry, and I wanted to spend some time with you uh, today just sharing with you the research that I took during my master's dissertation. You can find a shortened version of the entire dissertation on uh, my website, www.lisacherry.co.uk, under blogs. About 7,000 words taken from a 20,000 word. Um, dissertation. So if you want to stay in touch this is where you'll find me on Twitter and um, also my podcast which I'm very excited about because that's just grown so much since I started it a couple of months ago. Literally just put Lisa Cherry Trauma into Spotify and you'll find me. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been working in and around the field of trauma recovery and resilience uh, across uh, social work for 10 years, education for 10 years, and then the last 10 years I've spent uh, working with um, uh, training, speaking, and writing on trauma recovery and resilience. My first degree is sociology, and this particular research is from my second degree, which is um, an MA in education. Uh, I'm, uh, I've got two, there's my two um, adult babies up there, and then myself in the corner there. And my passion around the research that I undertook uh, really comes from a place of, um, of having that lived experience of the research that I did and how that, that drove that interest in looking at um, the intersection between being care experienced and school exclusion. So the question poses, uh, the question that's posed is what is the impact of school exclusion on care experienced adults who left care in the 1970s and 1980s? And having been a looked after child in the 1980s and having been excluded from both the secondary schools that I went to, um, and yet having such a passion about education, having had such a rich uh, professional career in so many ways, I was curious about what kind of pathways across the life course um, people took when they'd had those particular experiences and how they impacted in their education and employment possibilities. So one of the things that comes up initially for me in my literature review is really looking at what kind of things the people that are participating in my research are interested in and what things uh, researchers have traditionally been interested in and I found that there was a difference which led me to think about the voice of lived experience in research not necessarily from a participant point of view but from a researcher point of view and really thinking about what kind of questions do we ask when we're asking questions in research if we haven't had lived experience that's going to impact upon the kind of questions that we ask uh, we cannot escape our own experience in that regard um, and um, I asked five people so there were five participants I mean I spoke to Ivan Brady on the podcast that's being released later this week uh, and she did a PhD and she had 18 people so that just goes to show you really it's small numbers when you're really focusing on something like this so I was focusing very much on um, the that the five people so they were aged between 46 and 60 Ivan's research was 24 to 36 I think so really quite quite long in you know quite a distance into um into live into um the life course so basically I used um uh, qualitative gathering of data and within that that involved doing something known as coding and coding is about picking out the words and phrases that come out the most in the um, texts. So in the data, the conversations, the richness of the conversations. And these were the five things that came out. So exclusion, narrative, impact, change, and relationships were the things that came up 
over and over again. So using the word exclusion, the first thing that I would say is that I did not define exclusion. Uh, and by not defining exclusion, what happened is actually one person, it turned out during our conversation, hadn't experienced formal school exclusion, but she had felt excluded. Uh, because she had had to go straight into living independently and supporting herself. Um, so I gathered the research by doing, first of all, closed questionnaires. Um, so just gathering information, really, uh, so that I had an understanding of where in the country people were, gender, um, ethnicity, etc. Those um, questions that helped people locate themselves and me locate them as well. Um, and then it was the second, um, the second catch, capturing of data that allowed me to get some of this lovely, uh, rich conversation that brought with it so much depth. So here we have somebody. So now let's contextualize this further. And so this was in the eighties. So, um, Predominantly residential care was used far more than fostering. Um, so, and, and I think we also have to consider the criminal justice system as part of sometimes that care as well uh, in, in this context. So this person is saying, I approached the English teacher and said, look, you know, I'm aware of the fact that people do exams and stuff. How come as we don't do it? And he just blatantly said, we don't have that facility for boys like you and that was it and that very much resonates with my experience around education and in fact there was a comment in my file that said uh, Lisa Cherry needn't concern herself with education it would be wasted on her and I think those messages uh, were very very much part of a dialogue and a narrative at that particular time, this was before Sonia Jackson had really written the endless papers and pioneered really a, a, an interest in bringing care and education together. Uh, she really was, uh, in that sense, a, pi a pioneer. Um, someone talks about exclusion as feeling different. I felt very poor. I didn't have money. I, um, Someone else talks about wanting to go to grammar school, but so that they couldn't go to a non-Catholic grammar school. So exclusion is taking place in so many different ways, intersecting in, in so many different ways. Um, but four of the five people had been uh, formally excluded from school. There was an element of exclusion going on behind my back that I wasn't aware of. And I think that's that sense of people having meetings all the time about, about you and um, making decisions about what's right for you or what's not or what you should be focusing on or what you shouldn't be focusing on. And someone else talks about exclusion in terms of how they excluded themselves um, and how the child excludes themselves out of the environment. Um, and it intersects that with the school not being able to manage their needs. Narrative came up a lot because I heard sentences that sounded like internal voices that created that story. So, for example, I struggled with compliments because I didn't actually instill it in myself. I just thought I don't really deserve that. I'm not the same. I viewed myself as somewhat slightly different. And I'm always very interested in where this narrative and dialogue comes from. Again, through having been through the file reading process, I could see messages that I had carried that hadn't necessarily been spoken to me, but were clearly underlying um, a view of me from various people because I had felt them. I had felt that narrative and I, then I saw it in my file. So this is something that really leads us to think very carefully about narrative and about messages and also about how we record um, those messages for the adult who is likely to read them. There was always this message, again, this elusive message, where does it come from? 
that things were out of reach for me because I'd been in care. And from that point, no, you need to look at practical things. And I think what's going on in here is that the expectation around independence, the expectation that you come out of, of, of care and some, for, somehow, which somewhere between 16 and 18, you're going to be independent, which of course is a fallacy because none of us are independent. We're all interdependent in our ecosystems. But this idea that the message is very clear from very early on that the focus is on independence, the focus is on paying bills, the focus is on how you cook a meal, the focus is on how you create a self-sustaining, paid-for environment to live in. And that message is very much a part of what, what I see as going on here for this person. And, and interestingly, this is the person who felt they'd been excluded because the conversation was never around furthering education uh, in, in any shape or form. It was entirely focused on becoming independent. I decided I probably needed to get my GCSEs or something because when I'm filling out these application forms, I'm quite embarrassed that when it comes to the education part, there's nought to write on it. And again, when you leave school without any basic qualifications, uh, this has an impact upon self-esteem. Interestingly, I took um, my I took A levels and a degree with some funding, some help and assistance from a charity when I was between 20 and 24, I did those things. And I still didn't need those pieces of paper that I'd spent years lying about. Yes, I've got all these qualifications, all these GCSEs. Well, there would have been O levels then. But of course, when later on, when I went to do my master's, I had to have um, GCSEs. And so I took maths, English and biology. But back in the day, you could just lie. But what astounded me when I took those GCSEs actually was how much basic um, knowledge I didn't, I just didn't have. Really quite simple things like I did biology and the stuff around oxygen <laughs> was just amazing. Uh, it sounds so bizarre, but even, even talking in front of my children who absolutely just knew that stuff and took it for granted. And I was just beside myself with excitement at what I was learning. Um, impact. So what was the impact? So someone here's talking about having a surge in confidence and belief, the belief, I think, in myself that actually not only do I have the ability, I'm able to express it and express it well, not just for my own benefit, but also for the benefit of others. So that has been an impact for this person. Someone talks about motivating themselves, recognizing it's okay to have some aspirations in life, but I didn't know what they were. And someone else talks about doing a PhD in creative writing. Change. I just think education is something that we should recognise throughout your life course. Not that's it, you're a kid, you had your chance, you didn't get it. Whatever the circumstances are, tough. And I think this is something that I talk about a lot in training, really, which is if you ask a room full of people who undertook education after 20, after 30, after 40, after 50, you know, the myth of education being something you have to have achieved by a certain point is blown out the window because of course it simply isn't true. We are doing education. We have education available to us across the life course. Um, and of course, in an ideal world, we might want to go through that traditional route, but it's very clear. Any research I've seen that looks at the life course demonstrates very clearly that that traditional route is the least likely route to be taken. But that does not mean that the route isn't taken, but it's taken differently. And, and I think there's a real opportunity to think about how we, how we manage that tension under the auspices of um, uh, corporate parenting because it is a real tension, because if my kids want to go to university at any point, any point in their uh, life and I can help, I will. And they'll come to me and they'll talk about it. And you know, that option is available to them. That option isn't available if your parents, the corporate parent. 
And so there is a real tension about what corporate parenting actually means in the context of education. And I think we have traveled some distance with that, certainly improving legislation. How that always plays out in practice, I'm not so sure we're quite there yet. I think there's a big lack of understanding still, lots of unconscious bias. And if I remember the context that that was placed in was around um, people's view of adults who have a care background and what pe people think that means and how that comes across, particularly if you have the dual status of professional and lived experience and you see how that plays out when you're in meetings and when you're with other practitioners. And that's certainly something that, that has been a part of my career all the way through, particularly, particularly when working in education and social work and not, dis, not talking about my own experience in any meaningful way because I didn't feel safe and I didn't feel that anyone would be able to hold that space in a way that was appropriate. Um, the relationship that educators build, or rather that they don't build, very authoritative and I think schools are in terms of the spectrum where schools sit there is an end of the spectrum that has become much more authoritative uh, lately much more punitive the language is is much more disconnecting than we've seen in some time uh, but it is a spectrum and on the other side of the spectrum we do have uh, almost almost as a as a backlash to that a real relational approach occurring um, and to me, learning is, at, is, is not possible outside the context of um, not having relationships. Which leads us neatly on to relationships. I wish that there had been a person who was there at the time to actually say, this is an option. What is it that you would like? One teacher at the tender age of 15 did grab me aside and said, I'm going to make you sit and do O-levels. And we, that conversation that we had, I mean, literally did grab him and made him do his O-levels, which obviously I'm not going to recommend. I'm not sure we're allowed to do that sort of thing anymore. Um, and, he, and here's another one. Mr. B, great teacher. I used to take me to his house because most of the lads could go home at the weekend and holidays, but I couldn't. So it was a pretty lonely place. He used to take me up to his house and I'd go walking in the Peak District with him and his son. He was a good teacher. So again, relationships, somebody actually taking the time to think, feel, empathise, connect and relate. Um, when I got to 16, I met a social worker who changed everything. She started doing English and math lessons with me. And as a part of that, I began to trust her and I adored this woman and I had such a grown attachment to her. She's still around in my world. And I had an English teacher. She was brilliant. She was an influence. She was supportive. She treated me like, I won't say I had a gift, but she treated me as though I was special. And if I said to you that that person did a degree in English, a master's in creative writing, and is now doing a PhD in literature, we can really see, and she's 60, we can really see that longevity um, of impact from that teacher across the whole of the life course, um, uh, educationally. And that's it from me. Um, I hope you found that helpful and useful. If you've got any questions, do feel free to tweet me at underscore Lisa Cherry um, and I'll be happy to answer them for you. And I really hope that that was helpful. Um, and yeah, I will. Um, I'll catch up with you really soon. So thank you very much for listening.